West Coast around it. Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you all for logging on. I am sorry tonight for the late start. I'm joined by Tim Masso. We're gonna make up for it with a recursive program. Ha ha, it's a programming pun. <laughs> It's a picture in picture. Welcome guys, and thanks for joining us. We have a record setter on the table tonight, some independent horology, uh, Ublo, that I think you guys will actually like, and a wonderful 1990s third series Patek Philippe perpetual calendar chronograph that you cannot help but adore. All of this and your questions. Dear Lord. We have some fun stuff in store tonight. Thank you for joining us. Brian, what are you wearing? And so I am also sorry for the delay here. This is, uh, we were on a hiatus for a few weeks, but now we are back with what I think are some incredible watches. So tonight I am wearing a 5065A. Uh, it's a watch that I've worn on the show before. I would say it's probably getting more wrist time right now than any watch that I have currently in my collection. So this particular watch, uh, right after Patek Philippe issued, um, I think it was, the, was it the 5066 or 5060 was the first version of the watch? 5060. 5060. Uh, they then came out with the 5065, 38 millimeter size, automatic movement, and to me, the watch is just extraordinarily comfortable. It, it has almost like a vintage vibe to it relative to current day Aquanauts. Um, and again, as I said, I, I, I wear it more than anything else. And in case you're wondering, that is a Luce strap if you want to order one for yours. Of course, I'm wearing my EZM 1.1. I'm very predictable. I'm a one watch man. But you know what? I love it as much as a full collection. All right, let's see who's joining us in. I got to switch over from Watchbox Reviews to Watchbox Studios. And, you know, I'm going to hold this off. I'm, can, can we agree this is going to be the last watch? Because That's going to be the last watch. That's going to be the last watch. Okay. You guys could probably guess where we're going with this. It's a Bulgari Octo Finissimo, but it's the king of them. All right, joining in, we've got friends from all over the world. And I do apologize. Kevin been... S., Marco. We've got... Uh... Founder, Timeless Capital, We've Timeless been Capital. We've inconsistent. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of our regulars, so guys, welcome back. And again, sorry for the delay. Um, why don't we get started with uh, this piece right here? Yeah, definitely. So this is a really unique beast, um, and it's actually hard to convey just how cool it is in photos. So, th so here we have a 15202ST, also known as the Jumbo. And what's special about this watch is, is that... The Jumbo is inspired off of the original 5402 from Audemars Piguet. It's the most current version of that watch. The 15202 ST came about in the year 2000. It's gone through multiple iterations since then, and it's probably, you know, their most popular watch. It's their 5711. What I love about this watch is this watch is from 2000, and it is from the first batch of 15202 STs that were made. This one's actually number 39, so it's super cool. It's a really low number. It's one of the first 15202s that they manufactured back in 2000, and it's got this like bright cerulean blue that I just think is super unique. It plays off really nicely with the color of that loom, and it's really different than the dark navy of the jumbos today. It is dramatically different to the point that it almost looks like a different reference. One of the features of these 15202s, and this has been true since the very beginning, has, how, has been how much the color and the luminosity of the dial have changed over the years. They have at times been almost a slate gray blue. And then as with this one, it's almost an explosive blue lacquer. This is a blue that feels 2019. This doesn't feel like a watch made and in the year 2000. It's an E series, by the way. And this condition, by the way, is as good as you can possibly get. I'll also say that's important for reasons that have nothing to do with the dial because the bracelet has all of its original integrity. You can see E41000, which is a wonderful document for fans of Audemars Piguet's serial number because you know this is the 39 15202 made in the year 2000 and the timestamp for the serial numbers generally was 41,660 at that time if you're ever trying to date a watch with a comparable serial. Now, the other thing I like about these older 15202s is that the rotor itself was made with love. Skeletonized by hand and then chamfered by hand inside and out, it features the AP logo. It is a world removed from the ugly machined bevel of the modern AP 202, uh, 15202 lo rotor. While the movement itself is of the same finishing quality, the death of this rotor in 2012 still brings me grief. This was beautiful. This is what Audemars Piguet should be. Now, a few other highlights of this watch Talk that about, I want to... by the way, the case back being different than the underside of the bracelet. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, I'm gonna demonstrate uh, real quick how this watch is actually constructed. A feature that I've always loved about the Jumbo that set it apart from 
for example, the Patek Philippe 5711 is the fact that it is a front loader. Now, let me see if I can withdraw the crown enough that you could see, but there is actually a solid case back. I'm not gonna be able to show you the, the notch next to the crown, but the case back itself is integral to the, the mid case. It is a mono block. While a display case back was added, the case back itself is not a removable discrete component. So this watch is actually still built in the fashion of the original 5402, the jumbo of 1972, whereas today's Nautilus, the 5711, is a three part case with a mid case, a case back, and a bezel. So this one is still true to the original construction method. It still features the original JLC-based movement, and it still features the original dimensions as well as proportions, making this sort of a living fossil, a coelacanth for your wrist, if you will, whereas the Nautilus is very much an updated modern. Uh, well, the 5711 is a modern updated 3700 rather than a direct descendant. Yeah. Let me throw this on the wrist here. So, I mean, it is... To me, like, I, it's hard to actually convey how nice the dial is through video. It... To me, this particular dial is far more rich and interesting than, than the current iteration. Yeah, you buy this watch specifically, this exact serial number for that, that dial. Correct. That is an incredible rarity. It's important to note that before 2012, these dials were cut on a pantograph as they are today, but the, the dials were actually made by Stern Frere, which was a company originally founded by the Sterns who purchased Patek Philippe. Remember, Patek Philippe was one of the most important customers of the Stern family's dial factory, and the insolvency of Patek threatened the dial factory, and that was the original impetus for the takeover. Well, Stern Frere continued into the modern era, and it still exists today. It's actually owned by Richemont, but that was the producer of these petite and grand tapisserie dials for the Royal Oaks right up until 2012. So that is actually the source of this dial and its extraordinary, almost iridescent blue luminosity. Yeah, so amazing piece um, and uh, one that I was really excited to bring on the show tonight. And, and instantly different, like at a glance, you could tell that is a very different Royal Oak Jumbo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, somebody just asked, and I feel like this is like a great... Uh, movement into the piece is that Go an R, is that an rm question mark so that would be a no um but it's a watch that <laughs> but in its defense it's not a front muller <laughs> uh but it's a watch that i actually think is legitimately awesome the size the fit the feel um you know i think that they executed the piece beautifully it is actually a hublot limited edition 50 pieces uh it was called the west coast ceramic it features a a graffiti image on the back. It's a black ceramic case. You've got a white ceramic bezel. It's the 42 millimeter spirit of the Big Bang. So Tam, why don't you throw that on so the folks yeah, can definitely. see just how comfortable and how nicely this fits to the wrist. Um, so again, I think that for me, my ideal size of the Spirit of the Big Bang is probably 42 millimeters as opposed to the 45. Um, I think that they fit super comfortably. And as far as the, the price point goes, you can really pick these up at a good value. I remember when the Spirit of Big Bang came out five years ago. I guess it's six full model years pretty soon. But a lot of folks said, well, it's clear what they're doing. They're looking to get a Richard Mill style case in the Hublot catalog. But in my opinion, not only does this fit better than any other Hublot watch short of a caliber like 1300 classic fusion, but it's powered by a Zenith El Primero movement, which immediately gives it significant horological and cultural value. So between the movement that's in the watch and the size of the case, which you could see is just about ideal for a smaller wrist, this is a truly versatile timepiece. 50 pieces, limited edition, scratch resistant ceramic, El Primero movement, and 100 meters water resistant. Remember, your standard Richard Mille is only going to be 50, and I don't recommend swimming with a 50 meter push down crown watch. This on the the other hand, throw it on a water resistant band and you're ready to take the plunge. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like the watch, I think aesthetically is awesome. It's executed perfectly relative to probably the inspiration for the brand. It's priced far better. Um, I would, I would, it comes with two straps. I would probably add a, uh, a black rubber strap into the mix here. And it just, it makes for a great sporty, um, you know, unique piece and it, it's not some crazy color or something like that where it's hard to wear the, the combination i think is super straightforward and you really are getting a great as you said a great movement with this watch uh and so it 
aesthetically it works, and I think horologically it works. It's an awesome piece, and I gotta be honest, yeah, Ublo, they're a mountain of hype. I could do without the celebrity ambassadors. I don't need to go to a nightclub to pick up my watch, and in <laughs> fact, I prefer never to go to any nightclub. I'll be entertaining our Patek Philippe clients tomorrow, and thank God it's not at some sort of a disco playing nonstop dubstep. So this time piece pushes all of my buttons, except for the simple fact that, for the most part, I prefer, I guess, smaller brands, and that's not a knock against Ublo. Truth be told, Hublot can't help the fact that it's an LVMH brand and it's one of the bigger manufacturers. Not everyone can be as cool as Zen, but I will say this. It's got, a, it's got the beating heart of a Zenith, so it immediately appeals to me. And I'll also say this, it's one of the few Hublot products I could wear with a straight face. Now, if, and, but it's, and I think what's nice too about this particular size and the way that they've shaped the case is that I have a pretty small wrist and it fits me very comfortably, like I could wear this super comfortably and it would fit a larger wrist just as comfortably. So I and think that how, it's- How much would you love for some guy to come up and say, yeah, I'm wearing Richard Mill too. I'm like, fuck you, man, that's Hublot. <laughs> yeah, I actually like it better, I think. I don't know. I mean, I, I almost wish it had an exhibition case back. That's the only thing. But, um, but other than that, I just think they did a really nice job with the watch. Now, I had a question about the EZM 1.1 uh, chronograph detent pusher feel. It's a cam chronograph that is tuned well. So I would say it's better than most column wheels you're gonna find that are mass produced. There are a lot of column wheel chronographs out now that are, by the way, pardon the expletive. There are a lot of cam col uh, column wheel kind of in indistinct morass kind of watches. I would not say that it feels better or worse than say a moon watch, but if you're comparing it against something like a Zenith El Primero, so this guy right here, mm -hmm. uh, Longa 951, and uh, I would also say the Rolex 4130, those are the standards for pusher feel. Nothing is gonna feel that good. There's a broad gulf between truly awful cam chronographs, the best of the column wheels, and their watches in between, like a Moon Watch or the EZM, where you really couldn't tell if you didn't know the movement. So I would say all things considered, cam feels pretty good. So what are we gonna talk about now? A column wheel chronograph, naturally. So here we're gonna talk about, as Tim mentioned, a column wheel chronograph, uh, a pretty rare beast, uh, and it happens to be in exceptional condition. Here we have a 3970 ER uh, from Patek Philippe. Um, 3970 being a perpetual calendar chronograph. It is from three generations ago, so for those that you know, aren't up to speed on Paddock's Perpetual Calendar Chronos. You have the current iteration of the watch was the 5270. The prior version of that was the 5970. And then prior to that is here, the 3970. So 36 millimeter case, pump pushers. Um, you know, I think what's so special is that you really often see this watch in yellow more, you know, I, you know, pretty much all the time. I think I'd say it's probably by far and away the most common version of the watch. You see a lot less of them in rose white and platinum. And this watch was just really well maintained. It's in unbelievable condition. The lugs and edges are, are very sharp. And I think that these watches in particular offer an incredible amount of value in the marketplace. And I think that, you know, when you look at the prices of these for, that you can get a perpetual chrono for under, you know, a, under a hundred thousand, let's call it well under a hundred thousand. This, this is Patek Philippe pricing. We're saying everything, everything else being equal, that's a good y deal. Yeah, everything else being equal, you can purchase this watch for a little bit under a hundred thousand, or you can purchase a fifty nine ninety nowadays for a little bit under a hundred thousand. So I just think that, um, you know, these watches are awesome. I think they're, they're undervalued in the marketplace. I think you're going to see them come back in a big way, and. Uh, it's a whole lot of watch if you want something of this, you know, of this uh, aesthetic and size. And can we per be perfectly honest? I, I would take this over the Ublo. <laughs> I'm throwing that out there because we th we pushed the Ublo pretty hard for an Ublo. I got to say that probably got the most airtime of any like Ublo brand watch we've ever discussed. You uh, know, we and I think that one, you know one of the, you know, I think that one of the the critiques that the watch gets is 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 size. But it's really not that small. I mean, the, the the lugs are a little bit long. I think that it definitely fits bigger than a traditional 36. Um, and then it, it sits a little bit like a turtle because it's wide. Sure. So it's going to sit a little bit higher on your wrist uh, than some other 36 watches. Um, but just to give you a perspective of how it fits on my wrist, I mean, the watch is just, I mean, it's freaking magical. 
Oh, I want to also answer Bear Clooney watches. Our New Year's Shut resolution was to love Hublot, remember? I'm going to stick with that. I still have a lot of love for some of the stuff they do. It's just the brand is not my style. As much as I can acknowledge the horological value of the watches and the invention of many of the designs, I'm just kind of a low-key guy. Um, I would be the worst brand ambassador for Hublot ever. I would show up, I would ask for their smallest watch in their dingiest color, and I'd be like, okay, I'm good. I'd be the guy who goes home early and doesn't drink nearly enough. This is a watch I have to say that's actually better because it's basically 36 millimeters. You throw this thing on the wrist, and I think there is a guy who's looking for something a little bit more discreet today, who doesn't necessarily want to be marked for having millions of dollars, or even for having $100,000 to spend on a watch. I would go so far as to say there are going to be a lot of folks who wouldn't want to wear a 5270, who are going to feel a lot more comfortable wearing this. And I would also say that vintage always has good manners, and this watch from, you know, the mid to late 1990s, really does sort of qualify these days because it's so different from what Patek is making now. You've mm -hmm. got that column wheel lateral clutch Geneva Hallmark Le Mania caliber. It's not of a Le Mania caliber, let's be honest. Patek makes a ton of changes, both the bridges and the architecture of the regulator. You've got excellent finishing on everything. You have an enormous balance that's evocative of old school 20th century chronographs. Five position adjustment, free sprung, overcoil hairspring, and the thing is just... It's like a miniaturized pocket watch on your wrist. It is so anachronistic. I talked a little bit about Mi Moonwatch pusher feel earlier. I'm talking about the Moonwatch with the caliber 1861 or 1863, but it's important to note that the original Moonwatch actually featured a derivative of this base a Bausch. So this is the Le Mania 2310, and the Omega 321 was based on the same Le Mania a Bausch that was used to create this Patek Philippe CH2770. You could see there are exquisite details here, such as that extraordinary swan's neck spring with black polished top that acts as the yoke's tensioning spring. You could see that the bridge for the chronograph mechanism itself features a handsome mirror-rounded chamfer that's so broad and lustrous you can actually see it without a loop. And then you've got that giant balance wheel with the obvious dog leg kink of the overcoil amid a flood of steel satin finished levers for the yoke as well as the chronograph mechanism itself. This is just a gorgeous watch whether you wear it right side up or upside down and I actually think the fact that this is made of so many discontinued traditions, the design of the case, the size of the case, the La Magna base, the 18,000 vibration per hour beat, I almost feel like it's an anachronism that's more beautiful for that anachronistic quality. So for me, given a choice between that and a larger watch, I'd actually go for the smaller piece. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think, you know, it's obviously wrist size is important and how it's going to look on your wrist. If you have a slightly smaller wrist, it's going to have bigger presence and not appear as stressy. I think that one of the critiques that the watch gets is you're so used to seeing it in the yellow gold iteration with like a shiny black strap and it tend, it, you know, it can be a little bit small and that you think that it has this really dressy vibe to it. But, you know, something like this, if you put it on a more casual strap, it, it, it looks and feels great and you know relative to what it's going to cost you if you wanted to get into let's call it a 5970 or a 5270 it's it's, it's hard to beat the the price of these I, I would also say this the floodgates are open now that Patek has its own movements for these things so mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say that you know three to four thousand watches is rare objectively but when you start talking about how many you know, 5270s will have been made. How many 5170s will have been made? You the are watch talking... The watch is incredible. Yeah. You are talking the difference between, like, Zenith El Primero uh, powered Rolex Daytonas and the Rolex in-house caliber. So, yes, no Patek Philippe will ever be as common as any Rolex, but I do think there's a value to the La Magna, and before the La Magna, the value-based... Everyone knows the value-based. Yeah, Patek it's... Perpetual Calendar Chronos are worth a fortune. Okay, some questions. Let's throw in some questions. Guys... Ask us questions right here. I had a question. Do you think Diego Maradona does the Hublot brand justice as an ambassador? Brian, that's one for you, I think. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I, I again, I think that the methodology here is to have a lot of different ambassadors from a, a lot of different, uh, a lot of different, you know, sports, whether it's media, sports, in in order to appeal to let's call it as you know a broad base of people with small limited edition pieces so you know i think that do you know if they're making a watch for him do i think that there's 50 people out there in the world that probably would think wow that's kind of cool i have an association with him maybe he buys the watch he gets into it friends of his buy the watch you know and i think that you know overall um if it gets watches on wrists and guys are wearing the watch it's going to lead to more people buying watches and i think that the watch collecting community um 
that, you know, let's call a spade a spade, that are watching these sorts of shows that are on the forums is one microcosm in the overall watch world. I would be honest. If the watch he specifically endorses is interesting to you, then great. Otherwise, my barometer for ambassador quality is basically one, not a sociopath, two, really famous. That's, <laughs> that's really all there is to it. Unless the person's actually a watchmaker and is like, okay, I'm Elaine Silberstein, I'm coming in and I'm going to make the first Louis Erard that's not terrible. By the that's... way, that watch is on. Is that, I mean, is that it is, crazy? It is super cool. I, I honestly Open think... Open a new window, keep us streaming. I think I may be having to call and, and see if I can get one of those pieces. It's not, it's not. And they're not that much money. It's about no, 3,000. And it's it's a very reasonable size. I thought it was going to be like 44, 45 millimeters when I saw the pictures, like 40 millimeters. But we had talked about um, Elaine Silberstein in the past and how he's an underutilized designer um, amongst collaborators that A, he would do something very cool with Frank Mueller, but B, every brand... I think should have an Elaine Silverstein limited edition at this well, point. Well, as a friend of the brand, let's see, he, yeah. he's now got, he's got Romain Jerome, he's got MB&F, he's now got Louis Erard, he's covered every watch category and price point, and he's done that since, what, 2015? I'm I'm excited to see what he does going forward. We talked about how the old watches are great buys and potentially yeah. collectible. Like, he should do something with RM, I think it'd be a cool collaboration. Like, I think there's so many brands out there that he's got such a defined aesthetic, and we always get back to when you see a watch from across the room, yeah. Do you know what it is? And I think that if you know watches, you can look at Elaine Silberstein watch, regardless of what brand he worked on, and know exactly what it is and that it's him. And I think that that quality to it is transferable to other brands and and creates desirability. He's better as a sort of, uh, he could be the next, we might say like 30 years from now when he's dead and gone, hopefully he's still around. He's like the acon of, might, the acon of the watch business. He might <laughs> wind up being like one of the most iconic designers. We, we won't think about him as a brand chief. We'll think of him as one of the best designers of, of the modern era of watchmaking. And I will say this here, here's why he won't be a collaborator with Richard Mille, because Alain Silberstein is able and willing and eager to laugh at himself, whereas Richard Mille has absolutely no sense of irony. And that's why they will never collaborate. Yeah, I mean, you know, again, I I, I really enjoy his pieces. I mean, we've taken in a couple of his, you know, own branded tourbillons that I think are pretty cool and unique. Um, and again, I just, you either love them or you hate them. And I, and I fall into the love them category. I, I, I love them. I, I don't think you're going to find any contest on this show. The, the hosts are unanimous. Question from founder Timeless Capital. Tim and Brian, what are your thoughts on Rolex launching a new lineup of explorers at Basel 2020? I mean, to be honest, every time I think that Rolex is going to come out with something or all the rumors are leading to one direction, they end up coming out with something completely different. So, again, you you can make assumptions about what product lines need updates yeah. or are due for updates or are due for discontinuation. And then you you assume that that's what's going to happen. And then Rolex says, yeah, no, we're not going to do that. We're just going to do something completely different, and this is what we're going to do. And yeah, I think that that's why every single year people are sort of blown away by the changes that are made. Okay. I mean, back when they came out with the, the Day Date 40, yes. when they changed it, nobody thought that they, that was – Nobody thought that that year was going to be the year when they revamp the Day Date 2. Well, that's because there are some watches that are anchor watches, and then there are supporting watches. For example, if there's a new GMT, you better believe that's going to be the focus of the Rolex stand. There's going to be other stuff going on that year, but it's all about the GMT. When there's a new sub, that year is going to be all about the sub. The Explorer is a supporting watch. It's not a star watch. And here's how you know that. Back in 2010, when the Explorer became a 39, that was the first year you could get the Super Case sub in stainless steel, and that was the year we got the Hulk. That was the focus that year. Now, in 2016, the ceramic bezel steel Daytona came out, and that was the year the now 39 millimeter Explorer got loomed Arabic numerals. Mm -hmm. So we've seen these changes made in parallel to bigger model launches, all of which is to say the Explorer gets freshened every couple of years, but I would not expect to see an all-new model. At some point, you're going to see a three-hand, no-date version of the three-day power reserve caliber 3235. I don't think we're there yet. I think Rolex wants to finish rolling out that movement in the flagship watches. And the big open-ended question is when does the sub get the movement that you can already find in every sea dweller? And I think the answer is going to be next year. I think next year we're going to see a new mm -hmm. sub. The Daytona is still too hot to give Rolex any incentive to redesign it entirely. And there's no there's, there's no, no movement. There, there, there's no, I mean, it. again, and it's not necessarily, you know, I think that you'd sooner see 
the full lineup of precious metal Daytonas mm -hmm. receiving the ceramic bezel treatment, then I would see a complete revamping of the of the line. So is it possible that you know the precious metal, you know, rose white and yellow pieces that are currently on bracelets that still have the gold bezel, will those then get the ceramic bezel? To me, that's the next the next sort of move in the chain. I would also say this realistically, there may be some full gold bezel Daytonas that'll stay in the catalog. I think that that look will stay for some of the high end precious metal watches for the, for the gold. baguette bezel pieces for and the things gold. like that. Yeah, I, I think we'll see. The platinum watch is ceramic; it's going to stay that way. But there's no obvious movement upgrade that needs to go into the Daytona because it's already everything else. Whereas with the GMT, you've already got the new movement, new generation watch. With the Daytona, there's no need because the movement was so ahead of its time in 2000, it's still current. The sub really needs an update. It's hurting, it's obvious. They don't need the sales, but I do think for pride, they want to keep their product current. Yeah. No, I agree with that. Um, okay, let's, let's yeah. we've got two more on the table. So this is a rare beast. Tim's gonna tell you a little bit about the watchmaker because it's Tim. Um, I can tell you a little bit about the watch. So this is a, a unique piece, one of a kind watch uh, made by, I'm gonna butcher the name, uh, Antoine Prezuso, is that? We're gonna go with that. How would you pronounce it? I would say Antoine Prezuso. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so skeletonized movement, but what is so special about this watch is that the case of this watch is completely made out of meteorite. And when I say completely made out of meteorite, this is not like individual components. This is a monoblock produced case cut completely out of a larger block of meteorite for the case. Crown is also meteorite. And to me, it is absolutely awesome. I mean, it is, it feels like you're wearing something on the wrist from another planet. And, and it kind of is, it kind of is. And that's what's so, that's what I find so cool about the watch is a, I'm a sucker for meteorite. I love meteorite dials. I think, you know, incorporating it into the case here was uh, a really good idea and really interesting. And it really just created a special conversation piece that if you want to have something on the wrist that you can say literally came from outer space. Oh, and the buckle here is entirely crafted out of meteorite as well. So really cool watch, executed really nicely. Uh, and I think, again, if you're looking for something interesting, unique from an up and coming watchmaker that'll Tim and tell you about, this is this is that kind of watch. Yeah, I should also say that this guy has done it all. Uh, he currently has a full sapphire set triple tourbillon that is being considered for a GPHG category. It's in the chronometry category right now, and while I did not pick it in my forecast on quillandpad.com to win that category, it is definitely worth checking out the Antoine Prezioso Tourbillon of Tourbillon series. Now, this watch is one of his more accessible pieces. Despite the full meteorite case, it's important to note that this watch is not one of his Harry Winston Opus editions. That said, it is exclusive and special, and to stay on the GPHG theme, this year here, there is a meteorite cased watch from David Rutten, which is a fascinating jump hour that is actually up for the Petit Agui prize, and I'm actually going to pick that one to win the category. So I'm very into the meteorite case. It's simply cool, and like Brian said, out of this world. Now, the skeleton dial, this is what's known as electro spark erosion, which is to say it's a skeleton that's priced accessibly. It's not the true hand skeletonized, it's done with a industrial method, but it opens up the basic ETA 2892 caliber in a way that lets you see it and enjoy it in ways you never would otherwise. This is a watch that's all about the look, the feel, the attitude, and the small nods to its origins. You can see that little meteorite crest on the case back doubling as a flanking element on both sides. It is truly special, and if you want a little piece of the dream from one of the truly great modern masters, and a guy, again, who has made a Harry Winston Opus series entry, this is a wonderful way to get into it, and it will be a conversation starter and loomed. How cool is that? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I go back and forth between on the hands if I would have rather had the, the hands be solid loomed as opposed to skeletonized as well so you could see through. Um, but really cool at night. I mean, again, we're not going to be able to glow this thing, but it just, it looks really, uh, you know, really cool when the watch is, uh, you know, glowing at night. So um, again, cool, interesting watch, one of a kind. I, I, I almost look at it at this stage. It's, it's just a piece of art on your wrist. Yeah, it's certainly that. It's a piece of performance art, and you don't have to pay MB&F prices to get it. All right, this is my, oh, this is just cool. This is really neat. So here we have the uh, 
the final watch of the show. This is a Octafinissimo Turbion in titanium, titanium bracelet, skeletonized dial, limited to 50 pieces. Uh, and to me, just a grand slam, knock it out of the park watch from Bulgari. So Bulgari has been doing really cool things in watchmaking. Um, it has come out with the thinnest minute repeater in the world. And here we have the thinnest tourbillon in the world. So when you think about these watches from a complication perspective, that's pretty freaking incredible that they're doing this. This watch actually debuted last year as a triple title holder. So it, ho it holds, at debut, three titles. It, it was, at the time, the thinnest tourbillon, the thinnest automatic tourbillon, and the thinnest automatic watch. Do I have your attention? 3.95 millimeters thick. The movement itself is 1.95 millimeters thick. And I should mention, it is an automatic movement with a 55 hour power reserve and a flying tourbillon that features no upper bridge. This is the Bulgari caliber BVL 288. And it's significant for reasons that have nothing to do with this model. The basic winding system developed on this watch with a platinum winding mass was ported over this year for use on the Bulgari Octo Finicio Chronograph GMT. So they used the winding system from this watch, and rather than the tourbillon in the center, they placed the chronograph mechanism in the donut hole that the movement creates. Now you can see this is truly an extraordinary watch, and it is built in extraordinary fashion. To bolster the structural resistance of the watch, it could not feature a solid case back. So they included a sapphire so you can see the underside of the tourbillon carriage. The watch is a limited edition of 50 pieces, and as you can see, it is almost unnervingly thin, so much so that the crown actually overlaps the case back. There's more going on. You actually have a dual mode crown that can wind and set, but cannot be pulled out. So right now you can see the watch is winding, and it's winding until I press the trigger that puts it in a setting mode so I can now set the hands. And this prevents the watch from needing a conventional vertical keyless works with layers of bridges and springs. What it does is allows the watch to be operated almost entirely using a system of flat poised wheels that lie laterally flush with the dial rather than the thickness of a conventional keyless works as there's nothing vertically to add thickness. You'll also note that the unconventional drive system uses a great wheel architecture rather than a conventional center wheel, and the drive is off-centered. You can literally see the train immediately where it contacts the tourbillon carriage, beaten away at 21.6. I'm going to throw it on the wrist. It's a bit bigger than a standard Octo Finissimo. The standard Octo Finissimo automatic is 40 millimeters. The Chronograph GMT is 41, and this is a 42. And you can see, once you get under 4 millimeters thick, it's a different world. What's amazing is that they can sell this thing, build it in series, and apply a warranty. I'm thoroughly impressed. From every standpoint from finishing to mechanical engineering to exterior design, this is a brand defining watch. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And I think that Bulgari definitely threw the gauntlet down by coming out with these levels of complications this thin. I think that it fully puts them on the map as a movement manufacturer. And, you know, I think that, again, as they transition into producing more watches like this, you know, you talk about each year a few models come out and one's a hit. Each year a few models come out and one's a hit. And then you wake up and three to five years has gone by and you'd say, wow, like Bulgari is selling a ton of men's watches. And, you know, they, they've they just been producing out, you know, good pieces. And, and, I, and I'd say the same thing about Hermes, right? Like Hermes for a while, you'd be like, Hermes with men's watches? Like, I don't get it. But then all of a sudden they come out with, limited editions that work. The Houdinki piece, believe it or not, was a cool watch. They came, they're coming out with a production version of that watch, which aesthetically is pretty interesting, and it's an in-house movement. And I just think that if you put the time and resources and come out with cool watches, collectors will buy them. I'll also say this. Bulgari's gone a lot farther than Hermes in, in oh, fully a thousand, integrating this. A, yeah. a thousand percent. I'm just using the example of how, you know, brands like a Bulgari where they're not only watchmaking, if they invest in it, can make it work. Yeah, they can become more than a jewelry brand, and that's exactly what they've done. Now, I want to show something that demonstrates the level of attention to detail. Note the mode indicator. I'll try to show you this, but get super close, Andrew, and I'll get as close to the camera as I can. But there is actually a mode indicator that changes color from red to black, and it's located immediately adjacent to the crown. But as I change the mode to variously set the watch, and wind the watch, that mode indicator 
changes to black for winding and red for setting. This thing is just too cool. They thought of everything. Bulgari, well done. Now, the question becomes, what does it cost? Yeah. <laughs> Do we know yet? <laughs> It has not been priced yet. It has not been priced, but check the watchbox.com posting soon. All right, guys, one last quick question from the crowd. Let's take one for Brian. Okay. Bum, 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 bum. Okay. Right here, we, we got a lot of comments. I'll read some of them. BNS, I must say, this is a cool yeah, watch. I would probably guys. never wear or own one, just not my style. Kevin S. Jason Main should upgrade to that Octo. We got CQ. CQ the watch guy in the box, part of our own team. We are very, very lucky kids in a candy store. Gary Smith, I'm impressed, but it doesn't look durable. I'm actually sort of with you on that. Durable for me is it can be a dress watch. If you take that in water or decide to go golfing with it, first of all, we can't be friends. Second, all bets are off. And then ultimately- but I think it's pretty durable. I mean, all things considered, right? It's not a tool watch, but I don't think it's as delicate as other turbions may be. <laughs> I think it is. <laughs> that's that's the definition of delicate. <laughs> but which is to say, treat it with respect. That's all. Not to say it's defective in any way. Right here, question. You could, from... wear, it the, you could wear it the way that you would probably would wear a Finissimo. Okay, question from K. Kyle. Hi, do you know of any good watchmaking schools? Yeah, well, we're based in the U.S. I would say North Seattle Community College has a great program. Richemont has a program down in Dallas, Fort Worth. There's the Nick Hayek School of Watchmaking down in Miami. And then Lidditz, Pennsylvania, we've got the Rolex program. So you've got your options if you're stateside. Internationally, you're probably going to look for some sort of WOSTEP pro uh, program. And then there's uh, SOTA, which is the Rolex program internationally. I would also say, realistically, if you can go to Switzerland and study in the school in the Valley du Jeu, you'll need to learn French and you'll learn fast or you'll kind of wash out, but that is supposed to be the best watchmaking school. The Woe Step in Switzerland or the Ecole de Valle du Jeu. You know, that's the one That's the one you want to go to. Uh, fun, one Jane more question uh, from MVIC61191. Is de demagnetizing a watch at home safe? Uh, it's definitely safe. I mean, you know, you're pretty much just putting the watch on the demagnetizer. So as long as you have one and it's, you know yeah. how to you know how to use it, it's Nothing bad can happen other than you accidentally magnetize your watch and then have to demagnetize it. It's Correct. not like It's not like water testing your watch with a practical application whereby I take this, jump off a cliff, and then check the results. Yeah. So, well, guys, we appreciate you all logging into the show. And again, we apologize for that two-week hiatus. Oh, I was going to apologize for something else. What were you going to yeah. apologize for? No, let's just go with the hiatus. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, again, we appreciate you guys watching the show. Please tune in next week for the Watch Insider. Uh, do we have any announcements before we end? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I just want to announce that we are going to be holding the Batoon dinner next week. And if anyone is interested in attending that dinner in Philadelphia, please email tmaso at thewatchbox.com because that's going to be the hot ticket with Denny Flageolet and CEO Pierre Jacques present. That's an open invitation to anyone who can make it. So my name is Brian. This I'm is Tim. Tim. This is the Watch Insider. And thank you guys for tuning in tonight.